Now, if you would ask yourself, do you want to prospect? Do you like to prospect? Do you like making those calls? If the answer comes back, eh, I don't know. Well, you need to get to the point where you really do like it. And when that happens, you're always going to find the time to do it. What I ask new classes and uh, new associates coming in to the company, what do you think about top producers? Do you think top producers like to prospect? And most of the people will say, no, I doubt it. I don't think they do. And I correct them and say, you better believe they do. They love it. They thrive on it. They can't, wake up in the, they can't wait to wake up in the morning and get to work. They love to prospect. Why? Because prospecting leads to the appointment. The appointment leads to the listing. The listing leads to the sale. And the sale leads to a commission. These people love to prospect. And so they always will find the time to do it. So you need to get to the point where you want to prospect every single day. And that is something that you should do every day. For just a second, let's talk about prospecting. Prospecting doesn't just mean calling for sale by owners or expired listings. It's just prospecting is networking. It's contacting people that you know in every sphere of influence. One of the things that I always tell a class is that once somebody comes into your sphere of influence, they should never, ever be allowed to escape. You are now their realtor for life. Not just this transaction, not the next one, all of them. You're their realtor for life. Everybody in this world is either going to buy real estate, sell real estate, or know of somebody that's going to buy or sell. And what you want to do is place your name and your face in front of their mind so strongly that no matter what happens, they constantly think of you, quote, as their broker. Uh, unless you are over 40, 45 years old, you probably won't remember this. But there was a commercial on television many years ago. And the commercial always had the same type of venue. It was a crowded environment. There might have been a stadium or it could have been a, a large restaurant or a concert. But there was a lot of chatter, a lot of people talking in the background. And in turn, this camera would zero in on two people. And their conversation was always the same. One person would say, hey, uh, have you heard about that new stock issue? And the other person would say, well, my stockbroker is E.F. Hutton. And then it was dead silence in the room, and everybody leaned in to hear what E.F. Hutton had to say. Now, the key to that commercial, the key to that commercial was not the silence. That was a gimmick. And the key to the commercial was not the name E.F. Hutton. The key to the commercial were the words, my broker is. And for the years, six or seven years, that that commercial was on television, E.F. Hutton literally brainwashed the American public into associating that name as their broker. That's what you need to do in prospecting. You need to get to the point that everybody constantly thinks of you as their broker. Let's say you're going out into your farm area, and you're just, it's a new area. You're just cultivating this area, and you're knocking on doors. And you knock on a door, you hand your business card to one of the per people in the farm area, and you say, hi, I'm Phil Codger with Kai's Company, and I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be working in real estate in this area. If you ever have a need in real estate, don't hesitate to give me a call. And you give them your business card. Now, you go to the next house. What do they do with the business card? You know as well as I do. They don't stick it on the refrigerator. They don't tape it to something. They throw it away. So it's in the trash can. Now, that night, that night, a friend of theirs, a neighbor, comes over and they say, hey, we've got to sell our house. We need a broker fast. We've got to, we're moving. Do you know a good broker? You know what this person is going to do? They're going to say, just a moment. Let me get you my broker's card. And I mean, seriously, right out of the trash, they will pull your card and give it to their neighbor. Why? Because it's called one-upmanship. They know more than the other person. If I asked anyone, if I asked any of you, could you give me your, uh, or could you tell me a good dentist, you're going to give me yours. I mean, the guy could have butchered you the last time you were there, but you're still going to recommend them. And the reason is simply that you have one-upmanship over me. You know more than I do. And that's what you're doing here. Every person you meet is going to become the card-carrying member of your fan club. You give them a card today, you give them a card again tomorrow. Do you see them a third day? You give them another. Third day, what are they going to say? Hey, wait a minute. You gave me one yesterday. Ask them a question. Do you have it with you? Well, no. Well, keep this one in your wallet. If they say, yeah, I've got it in my wallet right here. Well, give this to a friend. Every time you meet somebody, your, your palm should be <laughs> stacked with these cards. Every time you meet somebody, they should have a card. That's prospecting. You want to continually do that. Let's go to the next slide. How to handle interpersonal conflicts. First of all, recognize it's inevitable and deal with it now. Is there anyone that's never had 
a spat or an argument with their significant other or a spouse, very few people can actually say that they haven't had that happen. But when it does happen, and let's say you're wrong and you know you're wrong, how do you communicate your apology? It's very important that you choose your communication medium wisely. Uh, one of the people on this call right now is a lady by the name of Sherry Claudio, and her, she obviously is my wife. She and I, years ago, before we were actually married, had an argument. And Sherry is also a trainer, and she was teaching a class that day. And I wanted to apologize because I knew it was my fault. And I walked into her training center, right in the middle of her training session, walked up to her, handed her a red rose, kissed her on the cheek, and walked out. Now, my question is, did I choose my communication medium wisely? Now, I'm not asking, did it work? Trust me, it worked better than you'd ever believe. But the question is, did I choose my communi communication medium wisely? And the answer is really no. And the reason why I say no is that I didn't know Sherry well enough at that time to know that it would work. I've had people in class when I've uh, told that will say to me, ah, you know, you did it because you didn't want to leave, give her a chance to say anything in front of all these people. She had about 45 people in her, in her class that day. And they're saying you didn't want her to be able to respond. And I was like, what are you calling me, chicken? And in a subliminal way, I think they're right. I probably was. I didn't want her to be able to say anything. I just gave her the, the rose, kissed her on the cheek, and walked out the door. I'm walking out, and all I hear is, does he have a brother? Let's say you, uh, you had this argument with your significant other or spouse, and you want to apologize. Send them an email. <laughs> Would that be an appropriate medium? Choose your communication medium wisely. Let's go to the third one, and that is be careful of what you say. It's going to last a lifetime. I don't know if you've ever heard of this expression, but having a closet in your brain, and some people do. Have you ever been talking to someone and they'll say something to you and, or you say something to them and they say, well, it's okay, don't worry about it, just, just forget about it, right? And then six months later, do you remember when? Do you remember what you said that time of it? Be careful what you say, it's going to last a lifetime. Number four, seek solutions, not blame. It's easy to blame people, it's easy to find blame, but it's very difficult to seek solutions. And then finally, when appropriate, seek good counsel. It could be your, your clergy, it could be the manager in your office, it could even be professional help. And don't be embarrassed by it. If you need assistance, don't hesitate to ask somebody. A search for our blind spots. Are you in control of yourself? Have you broken yourself of a bad habit? I can't see hands go up on this webinar, but I'd like to ask the question, how many of you have stopped smoking? Now, for those of you that are nodding your head or saying, yes, I did stop, I'd like you to please jump ahead three months after you stopped smoking, or at a point when you finally said to yourself, God, I did it. I don't have to have those things. I don't need it anymore. How did you feel? Did you feel at that moment as though you could literally conquer the world? You could do anything. Trust me, if you did something that difficult and you broke yourself of a habit such as smoking, you can do anything. You literally can do it. Number two, are you in control of your emotions even when things go wrong? You make a phone call, and in turn, somebody slams the phone in your ear. Do you get off the phone and say, I don't need to take that, and line the name out? Or do you go on to the next one? Are you in control of your emotions? Most people get off the phone and just say, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. And the reason, if you really think about it, the reason that we do that is that we take it personally. Trust me, you cannot take this business personally. If you do, it will eat you alive. These people are not mad at you. They're not venting at you. Well, I guess they are venting at you, but they're not mad at you. It's the circumstances that they find themselves in. They're literally caught between a rock and a hard place. Let's look at a motivated seller. You have a seller that is tremendously motivated to sell. They have to sell the property, but yet they're not getting the offer. They're not getting the offers they want. And so all of a sudden they get calls from uh, brokers trying to get a listing appointment, and they finally just, that's it, I've had it, and all of a sudden they blow up. But they're not blowing up at you. They're blowing up at the circumstances they find themselves in. So you have to control your emotions even when those things happen. And the next one is somewhat similar to that. That's you stay focused even in the face of adversity. In other words, things start to go wrong. You stay focused on what you need to do. And let me add something to this. When I was actively selling, I had an opportunity to list a friend's house. It was a guy that lived right down the street from me. And this is going back quite a few years. The house was worth probably about 
in my guess, when I did the CMA and the competitive market analysis, about fifty to fifty-five thousand dollars. And in turn, he said, "I've got to get seventy. And I just said, "It's impossible. It's not going to happen in this market. You're not going to be able to get that kind of money." And I turned the listing down. But I also said to him, "I have a friend that works for another company, and I'm sure he'll list the property." He did, and the property sold for sixty-eight thousand dollars. Now, for the next two solid months, I beat myself up. Literally, say you're an idiot. Why did you not take? You don't know what you're doing. And I literally lost business because I couldn't stay focused on what I needed to do. When things go wrong, do you stay focused? Look at number four. Do you allow the opinions of others to control what you do, and thus who you will become? A moment ago, I asked the question: Have you stopped at every for sale by owner, gone up and knocked on the door? Then I gave you a number of reasons why you didn't go up and knock on the door. Or why most people say they didn't, and that is that they weren't trained, or there was dinner, or uh, watching the ball game, or whatever. But if you really go to the heart of hearts and know, you know what it is. And the reason that I didn't go up and knock on that door is pure fear, and the fear is fear of rejection. And again, rejection is not towards me. In other words, it isn't this person criticizing me, rejecting me personally. They're using me as a vehicle, so to speak. They're saying all of you people, all of the realtors out there are the same. You're all the same. So the reason I didn't go up and knock on that door is because of fear of that person's opinion of me. Now, read this again. Do you allow the opinions of others or the opinion of others to control what you're going to do and thus who you will become? By not knocking on that door, I let the opinion of that person control me to literally be more important than my ability to become successful in real estate, do you allow the opinions of others to control what you do and thus who you will become? 